Well, tell that to the regions. Tell that to the people in Hong Kong. This is Robert Lord Hayward at the Harlequin Stoop Ground. Lord Hayward, it's fantastic to meet you and have okay. your company. I want to start with your childhood. What was that like? I was brought up on a farm in West Oxfordshire. My parents lived on, with my grandparents. It was my grandfather's farm. My mother was a teacher specialised in educational deprivation and my father was a translator when he wasn't doing work on the farm. What did your parents instil in you? Order, I think, probably. <laughs> Must have been difficult enough with four kids. Uh, and we have f lots of foster brothers and sisters, so we were quite often six children. Uh, it was a great family uh, in terms of day-to-day -day life, but I think in my case, certainly order uh, and an understanding of numbers in particular. You were fascinated by numbers, weren't you? Tell me a little bit about that. I mean, you're known as the, the pollster guru now, but how did that begin? It, first displayed itself, I suppose, when I was about seven years old and there was the Melbourne Olympics. I remember being obsessed by each set of results as they came back and the times that the runners achieved and the swimmers achieved and the order in which the different countries were represented. In terms of deciding what you were going to study, and I know that you went off to Zimbabwe, how did that take you on the next part of your life journey? Going to Zimbabwe was uh, a, an accident in terms of medicine in that I was ill for my A-levels, didn't get the grades I was expected to. I was encouraged to apply for Oxbridge despite my poor A-levels and uh, wrote a, an essay as part of the uh, section required on election results and I remember very clearly being told when I was interviewed at Pembroke College Oxford that my answer was wrong and the great irony is now that I'm used by the media as commentator on elections and yet I was told as an 18 year old the answer was wrong and uh, that to me says a lot about that you should carry on with what you believe you can do in one form or another. So I got to Zimbabwe and uh, had a great three years. So you then spent some time as a councillor at Coventry City Council. What did that experience teach you? Well, I was working as a personnel manager, director, uh, human resources, as it's now called, um, in industry. And obviously, I was learning a lot about work, work processes, negotiations with trade unions. But at the same time, when you become a city councillor, you have to deal with people's day-to-day -day problems, but also huge sums of money because Coventry City Council would have a massive educational budget, housing budget, social services, and so it was developing my expertise in parallel, I suppose, work on one side and the city council on the other. So talk to me about how the drinks trade became part of your life. Well, I started being head of personnel for Coca-Cola bottlers, five factories, 20 depots all over the country, which, during which time I was involved in introducing the first ever plastic bottles into this country. Uh, something that we thought was fantastic at the time, and I think is absolutely awful. I then moved on to being Chief Executive of the Soft Drinks Association, and after that to being Chief Executive of the Beer and Pub Association, which is a pretty good job title. <laughs> Everybody wants to be friends with that man. <laughs> absolutely. So you were able to sweep all that experience and take it with you into politics and you witnessed some really interesting times. I think all aspects of political life are interesting, whether it's my period in, the, in Parliament or somebody else's. But clearly, I was there from 1983 to 1992, Mrs Thatcher's great years uh, and uh, all the confrontations that were involved in that, the coal miners strike and the like and then the change from Mrs Thatcher, her downfall, through to John Major, and you saw so many different aspects of famous people, and you suddenly realise you're working with them on a day-by-day -day basis. So it's a fascinating life. You're using your strategy brain, your numbers brain, but was it the place that you were happiest? 
No, it's awful to say it. It's being very greedy to say that actually um, rugby is my first love in my life and being a referee. I wish I'd taken it up earlier, but it was a great combination being an MP and most of my time and then having this wonderful relaxation, although many people wouldn't regard refereeing a rugby game as a relaxation. The moment I got out on the pitch, it was, I was just in seventh heaven. And it, it isn't a question of power. It's because I actually genuinely was enjoying doing the role that I thought I should be doing, which is refereeing, but doing it to the best of my abilities. In your personal life, what was your experience of coming out? It, was, it wasn't easy. Nobody finds it easy to, be, to come out. There's no question about that. It's the hardest thing that you can do. In my case, I'd taken the decision that I would come out whether I won or lost in 1992. As it happens, I lost in 1992, which probably made it somewhat easier because you weren't the centre of public attention. But I was actually outed by a national newspaper, although in fairness to the journalist, he actually thought that everybody knew. The journalist chose to write a report on the debate in the Commons, and I was in the public gallery. And uh, the journalist referred to four gay celebrities. Michael Cashman, now Lord Cashman, who was an actor on EastEnders at the time. Ian McKellen, now Sir Ian McKellen. Boy George and myself, so it's not a bad line-out. Um, we were listed as gay celebrities. The funny thing is, I have never seen the newspaper. Tell me about the King's Cross Steelers. It's funny, looking back, six guys in a pub starting a, a gay sports club, and we've gone from six guys in a pub to a hundred gay inclusive teams right around the world, the Americans, gay community having taken to rugby for whatever reason. Being able to play it safely, but most importantly, being part of the rugby fraternity. And it now leads to having Harlequins with a Pride Day. It's interesting to get It's not too far away from kickoff here to see this afternoon. Good afternoon. This is Robert Lord Hayward at the Harlequin Stoop Ground for a game between the Quins and Wasps but it's their annual Pride game, the game in which they host people from the lesbian and gay community and hope that they will help change people's attitudes in society in general. I think the future holds much more progress. The fact that you've got Craig on the pitch, uncommented on, just another referee at premiership level. That's an indication of the progress that this sport and other sports should make. Tell me what it was like to become a member of the House of Lords. How were you approached? I got a phone call from um, David Cameron uh, to ask me if I'd be a member, uh, was willing to be. It didn't take me long to say yes. Um, but a great aspect of pride by the time we completed the conversation. But most of the time we were chatting about my role as an elections analyst and an opinion pollster. Arriving here on the day to become a member of the House of Lords with my family was just stupendous. I cited Coca-Cola as a sponsor of the Beijing Games next month and asked the question, what is it doing there? I went last night onto the web page for Coca-Cola Corporation in Atlanta. How ironic that when you go there, one of the five items identified is human rights. And it says, and I quote, respect for human rights and fundamental values is of ours. Fundamental values. Well, tell that to the Ouija's. Tell that to the people in Hong Kong who are losing their security. Tell me also the story around Airbus. What happened and how were you able to change things? In my early period as a Member of Parliament, Airbus was developing as a plane manufacturer to compete with Boeing. And the British government under Mrs Thatcher was unwilling to provide launch aid. So a group of members of the Commons, all of whom had aerospace constituency interests, 
got together and pressured the government and said, we will vote with the opposition unless you actually provide the money for the wing development in Bristol and in North Wales. And the government gave way. And the net result is that every time I get on an Airbus plane, whatever Airbus it may happen to be, I can look at the wings and think, I contributed to that. The gaining of the funding for Airbus from the British government means that today, every time a new plane is built by Airbus, there are jobs, there are workers, there are communities who are better off as a result of it, not only in this country, but right throughout Western Europe. Tell me about why you set up the Gulf Support Group. A friend of mine was in Kuwait when Saddam Hussein invaded the country and for, like thousands of people became hostages of Saddam Hussein. So I set up a support group, a contact group initially for the different relatives and friends so that they could really keep each other going while they waited for their loved ones to come back to this country. And it was absolutely exhausting beyond belief because you were dealing with thousands of concerned relatives and friends and they would ring up we had a Samaritans like helpline some of them were seriously distressed something of which I'm enormously proud started in August 1990 ran for a series of months negotiated completely privately with the uh, I I Iraqi ambassador here in London and uh, in the end, all the hostages came home. I want to talk about a part of your life, which is where people might refer to you as the veteran pollster. I hate the word veteran, <laughs> but I'll cope with the pollster bit. The, yes, I, I have some form of facility, and I think most people have a facility in terms of doing something well. Mine just happens to be the capacity to look at sets of numbers and see flows, see progressions, identify how they might vary going forward. And I've been lucky enough to be able to use it, to be successful at it, and therefore be asked to do more of it. I suppose the first time I really used it and other people used me in terms of the facility was during the crisis over Mrs. Thatcher's leadership of the Tory party in the late 80s, early 90s, when I just instinctively started identifying how people were voting and how they might vote and, and how, what would influence them. And ultimately, I was proved correct. And so it's in history that I partly contributed to Mrs. Thatcher's downfall. And then I was recruited immediately into John Major's campaign team and I went to John Major and said, I think you're going to do better in the general election than the opinion polls are forecasting, which ultimately proved to be the case. And when the pollsters had to explain why they'd all got it wrong and Robert Hayward had got it right in an effort to justify their error, came up with the phrase shy Tories, which I've been credited with, but actually it was their concoction, not mine. What are you most proud of contributing to in your time so far? I think probably the Northern Ireland same-sex marriage legislation, which I steered through, which took three days of debate, and I had to table all the amendments. I was given enormous assistance by the government, and by their lawyers, but that was a question of pride. The other achievement, award, that I'm proud of was something that came as a complete surprise to me. I was at a major rugby dinner with all the great and the good, the players, the journalists, the referees, for great regard for them, uh, just happily having an evening. And then they started giving awards out and suddenly I realised that they were referring to me. They started talking about chairman of a rugby club, referee, etc. And I received an honour for my services to rugby. Never expected it. As far as I'm concerned, I am so proud of holder of a, a glass tankard. Dangerous thing to give anybody in rugby is anything in glass. 
but a glass tankard for my services to the, to the community of Reading. Fantastic afternoon. Quinns have done the whole rugby community proud, but particularly the gay and lesbian community proud. And the opportunity for everybody, whatever part of the community they come from, whether they're different in sexuality or in race or religion or whatever it may happen to be, the message from an afternoon like this is be comfortable within society and society needs to let people be comfortable, whatever they may be.